Hey everybody, we have got one of the most prolific, proficient, and efficient hit makers in the house today. Tricky Stewart joins us for an exclusive interview. Um, you know the place you're at, you're at the place to be, that is Pensado's Place. Hey everybody, welcome to Pensado's Place. Can you believe it? Uh... Man, we've been hanging out together for several months now, like five months with you guys. What, what episode is this, 23? 23. 23? Yeah. yeah Man, cool. that's, that's just so cool. I mean, I never thought I'd make it past two or three, but mm, here we are. they huh? seem, seem to be enjoying it, right, Herb? So far, so good, we think. Yeah, man, uh, thank you guys so much. It's been a wonderful week. Uh, uh, for some reason, something was in the air I heard from uh, Tommy Allen, an uh, old guitar player that I used to play with, Billy Bryant, uh, Danny Miller. I mean, it's like all of a sudden in one week, like you've been you've been rediscovered. Yeah, yeah. Back at uh, it was like Southwest DeKalb High School week. <laughs> absolutely, you know? absolutely. And then uh, uh, hear from Chris Anacute and Martin Kurzenbaum. It's like uh, cool stuff. Uh, yeah, pretty cool. Well, then I'll ex receive your shout out, and I'll shout out to uh, our guys and do our homework. Uh, obviously, we're first and foremost, we all want to thank Vintage King, our new buddies hey, and strategic Vintage partners. King. And Alex. Uh, Alex is in the chat room, and Chevy and all our friends over there. Um, you know how to go to our page, um, which you'll see up on the screen. So Facebook, obviously, where we get a lot of your comments. YouTube, where you can see the show and stream it. Uh, obviously, our chat room is manned by our guy, Drew, who we call our CJ. That would be hey. Chat Jockey. Hey, hey. Uh, and that would be your camera over there, not up there. There you go. Got you. Uh, so that's, there, there's Drew. Uh, so our CJ will be in the room for, for a minute. Um, but um, we want to get straight away to some stuff. A, 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 another little bit of homework, which Dave and I will talk about for a second. Um, we have recently gone to HD. The network is real committed to trying to bring the quality uh, as best as can to you and therefore our technical staff has been just involved in that transition so during that time we've been banking and thinking about stacking up some ITLs for you guys so don't worry they're coming correct Dave? Absolutely in fact um, I love our audience we got some great ideas for ITLs yeah absolutely. my favorite one being find some real crappy-ass songs from your clients the, uh, and then tell them they're crappy and then... The <laughs> suck-ass tracks ITL. Oh, one of the cats uh, said, you know, instead of a WAV file, you've invented a whole new file called the SAT file, suck-ass track suck file. Suck-ass track. So <laughs> we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna monitor that ITL before we bring it that, to you. That it ranks funny. right up there. Who's our guy that does the twizzle flanger graphics? Brandon Hackler, man. Brandon, man. Brandon is, Brandon is my guy. hero. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So anyway, so we didn't want you to think we've forgotten about those. We want to make those better and bring them to you. We're, we're banking those up. Um, lots of good stuff. want to give a quick shout out to um, a guy who reached out for us and reached out for me specifically. Yeah. Um, we don't have, we, we try to give you as much advice as we can and give you our time as we can, but this, this guy inspired me so much. I actually went and sat with him. Um, his name is David Pacheco or DJ Primo. Um, he's running a 4.0 right now at the Recording Institute in Hollywood. He is committed to this craft and he just wanted to see if he had some advice. He was so cute. We sat down and he was kind of nervous. Is he that said, the same school that Drew never scored a grade point? And <laughs> never got a girlfriend date for me. <laughs> <laughs> so, I dropped out. <laughs> Wasn't for me. Anyways, a shout out to him. Uh, he's close to graduation. He'd be a great uh, asset to any studio in town. It happens Absolutely. to be around LA. Um, but more importantly, the educational part of this, which we like, is that it, it gets to people, it, it matters to people. I had a conversation with the chairman of the music department of USC, um, interested in the show, interested in Dave. So we love the fact that we're trying, at least we're trying to reach out to the, to the audience in a number of ways and it seems to be being received. So shout outs to all those folks. Uh, enough of our stuff. We got a really cool guest. Why don't you tell us about it and get, let's get to it. Well, first I'd like to, I'd like to point out that, uh, that I am wearing a shirt from the Herb Trowick Special Polo Collection. No, 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 I'm not shaking. Oh, no, 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 no. thanks, Herb. I'm pointing to your polo thing. What polo thing? Yeah, your polo insignia. It's exclusive. It's exclusive. Well, all polo shirts have polo That's insignia. Why is this so. one special? Because you're special. Okay. Herb, uh, uh, Herb, I can't thank you enough for this shirt. It's my uh, pleasure. Uh, you know, I love the fact that, that we're coordinated, and I really appreciate it. That <laughs> these things are expensive, Herb. Hey, man, listen, it's and classy. we have to call every morning and coordinate that list of colors, and today we were successful. Okay. 
Um, man, I, I lost my train of thought uh, like I ever had one. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing new there. <laughs> I like that. I like, I like that about, the, about uh, 4.0. That, that's inspiring. Uh, well, I'm about to toss it to you, so whenever you're ready, give me a shout out, and, and we'll go to the Tricky Stewart interview. I want to thank Tricky for spending time with us, and uh, I had a wonderful time. Also, a shout out to Erica McDaniels um, over at UAD. And what am I forgetting, Herb? To just go to the interview. Are you ready, Will? He's ready. All right, Will. Tricky Stewart, here we go. All right, guys, like, like we promised you, I'm sitting here with Tricky Stewart at and uh, I'm really excited that, that Tricky has taken time out of his incredibly busy schedule to help us out and, and appear on the show. Thanks, Trick. Absolutely. Uh, in case you've been under a rock the last few, few years, um, <laughs> Tricky recently has done uh, Umbrella, Ella, Ella, <laughs> Ella, <laughs> yeah. Rihanna, Usher, Moving Mountains, and several others, uh, Single Ladies, Beyonce, Touch My Body, uh, Mariah Carey, one of my favorites. I love what you did on that. Uh, Justin Bieber. Um, baby. Baby. You, yeah. you did another one, too. What was the other one? One Time. One Time. I like that one, too. And then uh, Katy Perry. Three on Katy Perry, four. Uh, I produced three and wrote four. I wrote Circle the Drain and Hummingbird Heartbeat. Hummingbird Heartbeat. And uh, What I'm Living For, and then I wrote Pearl. And then... Uh, Nova Kane, uh, Frank Ocean, Tricky produced that. Not a lot of people know that. I didn't know that. I'm trying to figure out. Uh, I, I'm calling Andrew to see, you know, if he's heard it. And he said, "Yeah, I heard it. I mixed it, and Tricky produced it. <laughs> yeah. Incredible." We'll talk about it a little later on, and then, of course, all the new Idol stuff. But man, thanks for doing this. I know, I know, there's a pain in the butt, but I really appreciate you doing it. Anything for you, man. It's all good. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Um, I know a little bit about your history, but fill in a couple of the blank spots for me. You and I first met on, what was it, Immature Album? Immature, 1992. Ooh, doggies. I yeah. don't think I was born then. Sure you were, and you were already old. <laughs> <laughs> so, you mean wise? Yeah, you know what I mean. <laughs> old. <laughs> I entered the business old. Um, let's, let's call it the early period. What's your, what's your favorite song? From that time period, I know you did a, had a big <laughs> hit on uh, on uh, help me out here. What what immature later became? I M X and then B two K. Yeah, B two K was yeah. a big B two K hit. Yeah, that was so. It cool. was um, uh huh. Their very first single was a record that I did. That and was it, a and huge it, record. Yeah, it, it did pretty well. It was number one for you know six seven weeks or something like that mm -hmm. and sales and everything and that was right at the time when people had started paying attention to single sales so um you know that one felt good that was that was a great record yeah man that was when i still used to do the shout outs at the beginning of my name like with be like red zone uh-huh like all that funny stuff i don't do that stuff no more but you don't have to now 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 if you just look at the label it has your shout out <laughs> <laughs> but anyway uh we were just talking earlier before before Will started rolling the cameras. Uh, I guess I guess maybe those were the good old times, you know. Although I think now's the good old times. Well, for me, they're all the they're all the good times because anytime, anytime that you can make your living doing music, those are the good times. So, yeah, you know, so those good. those were good times, and these are good times, and I'm looking forward to more great times. So. Probably, well, not probably. My my greatest musical experience ever was that that little trip we did to Vegas. Uh, actually, it was I guess it was over about a six month period. We were in Vegas with with uh, with the entire Red Zone team. Andrew was there. Jason was there. Kook, uh, Pat, you, Tech, Tech, Dream, and oh, of course, Dream, <laughs> Dream, yeah. and uh, it was all everything was kind of new and fresh. I mean. Man, what we did during that time period, I say we loosely, I mean, what you did and, and, and I kind of piled on to, what did we do? We did Celine Dion, we did Usher, we did uh, LL Cool J, Jamie Dream. Foxx, Dream's record, entire record in a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. um, Mary J. Blige's album. Mary J.'s album. A lot of Grammys on those trips. It was, that was kind of a magical time. I'm not... Uh, you, you, you and Dream were like, it seemed like every day you'd play something, and we, we were like, oh my God, this is the best song I've ever heard. And then like an hour later, 
Oh no, this is the best song I've ever heard. It was like, it's like, have you replicated that again? Was that, was that, how did, how did that come to be? Was that a? Well, you know, it's, it's um, that was a very special time. So I don't know if that could be replicated, but, you know, the energy of what we do when we're in a room is so explosive that you know that's just kind of how it works. You know. Mm -hmm. So whenever we've just gotten kind of used to that, you know, having that chemistry and that ability to like mm -hmm. write songs that stand out, that are special, that mm -hmm. you know catch people's ears. So, you know, I, I definitely know that there'll be more times like that, and you know, oh, we had course, we had that yeah. time, um, you know, a couple different times, but you know, Vegas being the most significant and special one of all time. Yeah, well, awesome. Man, that time. was kind of cool. <laughs> Did, did you start as a DJ? Uh, no, I started, you know, my career basically got started from watching my brother Laney and, and you know, being around his studio and watching him put bands together and uh, really be a musician. And, you know, I, I more so, like, kind of got involved with church and playing in church and kind of stuff like that. So that's where my okay. musicianship came from. And then... Um, it just came a time where he was like leaving. It was, you know, when sequencers really first started. Mm -hmm. You know, like when the D20 and the MSQ, you know, I mean, oh, all the wow. MSQ 707, like I was watching mm -hmm. him from that time. And then from, you know, there was just a time where he would start leaving extra equipment around and, you know, I got a chance to really, you know, start messing with stuff. And if it mm -hmm. wasn't, you know, messing with a keyboard like that. It was just taking a piano and a two tape recorders and then putting down the chords in the bass line and, mm -hmm. you know, whatever, whatever how, it was. How old were you back? That's like 12, 11, 12? Yeah, this is, you know, 12, 13. Oh, yeah. You know, just recording at any, any level, you know, with whatever. You've always, since I've known you, uh, your records always sound fresh, they always sound different, but in a good way, they always sound new. You're always just enough ahead of the curve to to to, to be new, but you always have a, a homage to the past in all of your records. How do you, what's your process, what's your creative process that, that allows you, when you sit down to write something, are you thinking like, God, this has got to be different, or is it just, it's just, it's just a function of, um, of all the stuff you've been listening to lately, or, or I, I just think, you know, every person who is a creator of music has an identity of their own. Um, a lot of times you don't hear the identity of a producer because they, a lot of times they're copying somebody else or what they hear somebody else doing. But my, my, influences, um, my influences have been the same. You know, I'm from Chicago. I mm -hmm. live in the South, but I also travel the world. Mm -hmm. So... For me, it's the Chicago guy that moved to Atlanta, that has seen the world, that wants to make a song that works from my hood that I came from to the one that I visited to the places that I want my records to play if I'm like on a yacht. And it doesn't matter. It's, a, it's all the same. You're trying to strike that chord in people where there's an emotion, an emotional attachment to your music. And for me, that's just taking into consideration everything that I've heard, um, what I'm personally into, you know? But it's not, you know, all those thoughts aren't in your head. You just sit no, down just, and that's what comes out. It just out. comes out. It just comes out. But it's not, a, it's not a conscious process. It's just who you are. Yeah. It's just, it's just natural. You know, when Pharrell makes music, for instance, he naturally sounds like himself. You yeah. know, you know, the Neptunes get in the room, they're going to sound like the Neptunes. Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis get in the room, they're going to sound like Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, it's not, you know, but their influences of Minneapolis or, mm -hmm. you know, Neptune's Go-Go and what the musical rhythms that they're, you know, come from on that side of the country is you can always hear that prevalent in their music. That's why you like the rhythms to their tracks so much and to their songs and stuff like that. When you were a kid, were you influenced by the radio stations in Chicago? Is any of that creeping into... Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's the region, and I think the people from Minneapolis that when you come down, you know, the middle, all the way down from through the Midwest, from the people that are from Indiana, the ones that are in Illinois, I think it's one, we didn't belong to a coast. So it's <laughs> like we didn't have a heavy influence of East Coast or a heavy influence of West Coast mm -hmm. or down South music. We had 
kind of like the best of the best and what kind of mm -hmm. meets in the middle. And um, from that standpoint, I think that's why when you hear a Kanye West music or you hear R. Kelly's music or if mm -hmm. you hear the Ohio Players music, people that come mm -hmm. from that region, it's always um, the, the creativity behind it kind of moves around a lot. You know, it's not just necessarily in one place. American Idol, which you were a huge part of, the the two biggest vote getters were they weren't just country. They weren't like post Garth Brooks country or uh, they they were pretty hardcore country. I mean, like uh, pretty hardcore country. Right. And and uh, Idol's a popularity contest and it's available to the entire nation. Is that a trend? Is that something we need to pay attention to? What when, when you when you start writing? And thinking about developing an artist, uh, or or thinking about what artist to develop, is, are there any any insights you can give us? Because because you've shared some of those things with me in the past, and you were always just I mean, you, you're kind of like the Nostradamus of the producer <laughs> set. <laughs> you silly. I just think, from the standpoint of, from Lauren, standpoint, and from Scotty's standpoint, I think they saw they sang the most hits that sounded familiar in the region that they were trying to appeal to. Oh, that's interesting. So, and I think they both had, she has an amazing voice and he has a tremendous amount of voice recognition. I think if you could take those stars or those, those artists that want to be Rihanna, if she, if somebody out there could come out there and sing a song like Beyonce, they could win the competition. But the point is, they can't. So the thing is, country is a little bit more, it's just, it's a little bit more, it's, they look closer to being stars in the genre that they're going into. I, I think I know what you're saying. So, whereas, let's say, uh, Naima, she doesn't, she needs the polish she needs really more layers to close the gap between um, what's going on in pop culture and the girls that she wants to compete against. Mm -hmm. Whereas with this, I feel like they, their voices were the closest to sounding like greatness in that genre. It seems like now the internet is rewarding honesty and sincerity. It seemed like Scotty and uh, Lauren had that same kind of honesty that that Frank Ocean has, that uh, Tyler the Creator has, that Adele has, and it, it, are we entering possibly into a period where where uh, her makes fun of me when I say this word I can't say it genre 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 say it for me genre when we're getting into where that doesn't matter anymore as much as the sincerity and the honesty is that is that is that possible? Uh, well, a small reason. You know, this is this is a big, huge question in music. Um, I think <laughs> this is a question that's been going on for a minute. In the sense that you have, yes, to answer the question, I hope that it's getting into things that are more organic, that mm -hmm. are more real, that are mm -hmm. uh, that come from a place where there's a soul in, behind the music, and and that you can really, really connect. Mm -hmm. With that being said, they still got to find little boxes to try to put everything into. Oh, absolutely. Because that's the only way that they can justify it. But for me, you know, I'm hoping that, you know, they do realize that the people that still are engaged in music and that are buying music, I'm hoping they realize that their taste isn't quite as small and this song doesn't have to be on this radio station and this song doesn't have Before to be on that radio station it. and yeah. it's kind of you know we just need to get back to some originality because when we look at the things that we celebrate in our musical society there are things that might not get signed so what we, what we have to get back to to me is the greatness really moving forward and when you know the artists that are truly letting it go that are just going to be creating no matter what the situation is you know I think the days of artists that, you know, wait on the recording budget to open up in order to make 12 songs is over. Yeah. You know, I think... Say that again, that's very important. I'm going to write that down. I just think, you know, there's certain recording artists that are waiting on a record company to open their budget. 
you know, to make to uh, make records. And this is it's your art form. You have to. This is uh, there's a lot of negative things that came with piracy of music, but there's a lot of freedoms that came with it too. Mm -hmm. um, so I think from the standpoint of just being able to create in how much lower the price is to be able to go into a studio or grab a laptop or whatever the situation is, mm -hmm. you can now write your budget open because no one is sitting at home like not waiting to hear the next great song. So you, if you take your art form into your own hands and become a great writer or they're signing people who write their own music or mm -hmm. that can perform their own music, just people who have music as the core of their being, you know, I think that's yeah. where we are in music is that the music industry has got to purify itself into the sense that the people that are doing it would be doing it to the day they die, yeah. no matter what, and not, you know, a great idea of a producer who puts this together with that, and then next thing you know, you have like every label has ten That's of them. That's interesting because you're kind of you're kind of talking about yourself there, you know. No, I'm not talking about myself. <laughs> That's not the type of talent that I find. Uh, I know, but um, when you were doing those idle things, Andrew was telling me you guys just had like. Like you'd have to do two songs in just a matter of hours and turn it around and get it back on the show. I mean, no, it was, was that hard or did it help you? Um, it was. It was. It was challenging, but it could be done. But it took every bit of experience that I have in making records to be able to make records that fast. And you had like what six hours, ten hours, or something well, per song. Like you didn't have to do well, two songs in a night. What it is is there's there was different types of um, deadlines, and you had the TV deadlines, and you had the record deadlines, and then you had the deadlines that the kids needed, and it all had to be done in a certain amount of time. So on a Friday, we would go in, find out our song assignments, and over time, those things when you started dealing with the minors, those things started getting later and later. You know, so at first it would be a situation where we would get the music and maybe you would get, you would know what song you were doing at 3 o'clock in order to have a 9 a.m. session. And then it started becoming 6. Then it started becoming, you know, and you still got to get there at the same time because they don't know, like, because it's filming. So it's like just things naturally getting pushed back and stuff. So it's nothing that you can really do. And then, you know, now you're getting the songs in the last couple of weeks at 7. Seven in the morning? No, seven at that night. Uh -huh. And you have to program two songs, come up with the arrangement, and be ready to uh, be ready to uh, do vocals that morning. They only have um, three hours per kid, you know. And by the time that was said and done, that ended up starting to be more like an hour and 30 minutes. Um, and then you go from that into wow. the backgrounds and... You got to mix, and I mean, mm. you got to master, and everything's got to be done from that Saturday. So we were basically running a schedule where I would go to the studio on Friday, and I would come home on Tuesday. Wow! And then, like, the mixing would start at six a.m., and you know, it was just a, it never stopped. It was just a different shift for a different. And the stuff, the stuff sounds good. I mean, th maybe, oh, yeah. maybe that's, maybe you're onto something there. You know. I mean, we Don't didn't tell Andrew. I said that. <laughs> no, we didn't sacrifice uh, the quality, but we just had to put the hours in differently. It was, you know, we were doing a week's worth of work. Were, were you using live drummers on a lot of that, or were you using BFD or Superior Drummer? We were using a mixture, but you know, we used live drums. You did some live yeah. drums and some pro. Yeah. Because man, bit, it seems like the, the more program you could do, the more time you could save. But even even then, you went to the life. Well, it's easier sometimes to when you when you're programming. It's easier to uh, just have somebody that can play, you know, play it naturally versus you have to interpret the whole arrangement in you know at the same time as one person. So some of them, you know, it just depends on what's better for each song. On the Frank Ocean song, what was that like little knocky sound? That dun, 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 dun. what was that sound? That's a good um, impression. Nova it. Um, yeah. It's a it's a it's a nineties loop. I can't remember like exactly what the loop is, but I just took the kick and truncated it down and just made it knock and you know. That's the coolest sound. Yeah, Frank likes stuff that's dirty, so we can pull out the old sounds for that. Getting back to the industry in terms of being able to make money as a producer in the industry that, that like some of the guys coming up now, 
could possibly be the next Tricky Stewart. What, what's their world going to look like that they inherit in, in 10 years? How are they? I mean, are you finding that it's harder to, because you've got a pretty big operation. You've got your own label. You've got studios on every coast. You've got uh, Publishing. pretty big staff. You're a publishing company. You, you develop artists. I mean, you've got some great writers, of course. I mean, is, is it getting harder or is it getting easier? And where do, where do you see it in, in terms of like all going? Because some days I think, man, maybe I better get my AARP card out and run over to Home Depot and get me a little job going over there. Like... <laughs> no, no, I think music, the music industry is going to be fine. You know, um, it's, I think everything changes and everything evolves and, you know, this is no different, you know, but at mm -hmm. the end of the day, music, music has changed and it's evolved. It's, it's turned into the iPod. It's turned into the American Idol. It's, uh, our industry has to just do a better job of making sure that we are, uh, the American Idols and that we are the, uh, the iPods in the future and, and get better deals. But, uh, we have the have the money come to us is what you're saying? Yeah, well, because you know, music is a vital part of life and for everyone. And it's not that people don't have music. We're not talking about whether or not music is alive and well. We're talking about whether or not how we're going to get uh, compensated for it. Mm -hmm. Because the blank CD is the highest selling CD, and it sold four billion copies last year. So what goes on? A, what goes on? <laughs> it took a second to register. What goes on a blank CD? You know, for the most part, it's music, and what goes on an iPod. So people have just changed, and we have to get with the times. And but for me, as being a content creator, you know, I I win the game that I'm playing. You know, the game is going to change. There'll be a time when someone will ask me to do. You know, it, just like anything, there's going to be times when people are going to ask you to be uncomfortable. But it's is your commitment to doing it how you want to do it, or is it to being in music and being a part of music? And I've made that decision to always, as music change, to change with it, because mm -hmm. the alternative is not anything that I'm willing to entertain. Well put, well put. I wish we had an audience, because we'd be hearing applause right now. Yeah. But <laughs> the subscription model, is that is that part of the future you see or is it or or are, are you seeing a fee paid for every iPod that's bought or a fee paid for every C D? I think well, they tried that during the cassette days. Well, you know, it's it's definitely you know, uh subscription base is definitely um waving its hand and I think, you know, truthfully that is the way that it's gonna end up. I don't know how you know, this all shakes out, but I do know that people love music. I know people are looking for music, and I know that people are going to make their living from music, and I just think it's up to us to redefine what music looks like in the future on paper, you know, for mm -hmm. for the people who have, you know, um, so comfortable in how it is, you know, but change has to come in it, into anything, and it's time for us to change. It's just time, you know, who moved my cheese? Like, a, a lot of people have read that book. It's The cheese has been moved, but the cheese is still, and it's just someplace else. If your little girl came to you and said, Daddy, I want to be a producer, maybe a writer, maybe an artist, maybe a publisher, I might want to own my own record company, what, would you, what area would you encourage her to go in? Publishing. Publishing is where it's at. But it's in all the areas. But, you know, as a creator of music, you are a publisher. The moment that you sit down to write, you're a publisher. The question is, do you want to sell it to somebody or do you want to keep it for yourself? Nowadays, you can just grab a laptop, a, a controller, and pretty much make a pretty good record, right? I mean, do you see that future is, is bringing more people into the process and perhaps... It'll bring more bad people, but it'll bring more good people too. Are you are you taking advantage of some of that now yourself? You know, for me, you know, I like the uh, I like the laptop. You know, I think it's I think it's dope. I think you know it's what I always dreamed about. You know, as a kid, it's like what you have the ability to do with laptop music is uh, amazing. I just wish it cost a lot more. <laughs> you know, I wish. I wish it cost a lot more so that everybody didn't have one. And I wish that and I wish that the softwares couldn't be cracked.
Yeah. Speaking of software, are you are you recording with um, Logic? Is that your go-to sequencer? Um, no, I, I sequence in Logic, but I sequence between um, Logic, Pro Tools, and PC 3000. You know, I just sequence in whatever it is that I'm trying to get done. Doesn't, I don't have like a specific one. And, and you know, honestly, I don't, I don't really program that much. You know, I play everything a little straight. And then the stuff that has to be programmed, I program. If he decided it to be a mixer, he'd just go straight to the top. Or, he, or a record executive. Or a record executive. Well, he is a record executive. Well, absolutely. I mean, absolutely. But, uh, one of the things I learned from Trick is, um, is sometimes, sometimes we have a tendency to overemphasize certain things in the mix. I'm not quite sure why we do that as engineers, but Trick, he just has a, a, a policing sensibility about um, just the right ratio and proportion and stuff, you know, mm -hmm. like there'd, there'd be times when when Jay and I thought we were just changing music and Tricky would come in and go, turn that down, or however Tricky says it, you know, right, right, this right. ain't about the kick drum, this is a song, we're selling songs here, you know. Well, one, of the, one of the lessons, I think, um, for our audience is, is that it, it pays to be a student of it all. It yeah. informs all of your art form and, yeah. you know, not to go into historical stories, but Tricky has been a student since, as he talked about musically in the interview with his brother and so on and so forth since he was young. But also on the business, if you were around Tricky and he was around us in the studio mm -hmm. for a number of years, and he was always this quiet fly on the wall, taking it in, absorbing yeah. it, processing it his own way, and yeah. coming up with his own conclusions. Just the whole shows. family, the whole Stuart family. Oh, no question. Mark Laney. No question. Uh, just, just class acts all the way around. I've, I've learned so much from all of them. And, uh, I love the... Um, the note about being b born in Chicago and how those influences, because sometimes when you're away from the coast, you let mu other musical influences come in and you, mm -hmm. you get a hybrid and you also get a sense of the marketplace because mm -hmm. you just have people there that are, you know, representative of a broader scheme and less influenced and, and those guys that come from that space, it's always music that had an edge but had a universality and was pop and R&B and other things. and. Yeah, I think I thought he made a really we've had point. we've had two producers on so far. We had Evan mm -hmm. and we've had Tricky, right? Mm -hmm. We should we should have a few more because I think uh, I think it to get that perspective kind of gives you a road map on how to mix. Sometimes mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. the, the, listening to the rough mix is a good indication of what the producer's thinking. Yep, especially in Tricky's case because he spends a lot of time with Andrew yep. on the rough mixes, but. Um, there's there's a few other producers that I've worked with, that, that, but Tricky, of course, is, is my favorite. Well, you know? cool. Yeah, I love. Absolutely. I mean, we I've known him, gosh, since he was like twelve, or fourteen time. or something. Long time. Absolutely. I mean, he, yeah. he was one of the first people I worked with out here. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, you know, another another whiz kid like that is Vincent Herbert. When I first worked with Vincent, it was three guys from Newark. Mm -hmm. He was like, mm -hmm. I think Vincent was like thirteen or something. He's doing pretty well. Doing Michael Jackson remixes Absolutely. or something. Absolutely. Another student of the game. Yeah. Somebody's looked at Absolutely. all sides of it. Absolutely. And, and created businesses, substantial businesses, from being that good in, in a number of places. But you know, guys, one of the things to philosophize a little bit, um, one of the things that, 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 that I've noticed when I, when I, when I sit here and, and listen to all these great, talented people talk is just the passion they have. You'd think that some of these guys had never made a penny yet. And, 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 you know, I mean, a lot of these guys are pretty wealthy and their work habits are identical, probably even work harder than when they had nothing because it's, that's not the motivation. Yeah, it's a factor, no doubt. And uh, Tricky can't afford anything he wants, but just the sheer passion and enthusiasm for what he does. I think it's a, I think yeah. it is a, it's a dynamic among the greats. So whatever you're doing, absolutely, passion has got to be part of it. And then, and I mentioned it. Um, I mentioned it when I was talking to Tricky. The importance of a support team. The importance of like, Tricky probably has one of the best, if not the best, support team around him. Mm -hmm. um, I can name everybody, but I think I did on the piece. But uh, it's it's so important doing what we do at any level to surround yourself with with good people not just good management not just good this that or the other but just 
friends that give you the uh, friends that just tell you when you got a booger and when you don't. You know, well, it's that, like that's that's classy. Yeah. <laughs> it's perfectly classy. So let's segue. Why don't we? Because uh, we got tricky coming back in batter's box. Okay. Well, and you know, batter's box with our friends from Vintage King, Alex. Yeah, Alex from Vintage, Vintage King, King is is in the chat room. And, I was on uh, Vintage King's website this week, man. I tell you, yeah. I was trying to learn a little bit about uh, different converters. You know, because mm -hmm. um, I get asked those questions. And, man, what a great website! So tell us about um, oh tell batter's us about box. Batter's box. Yeah. <clears throat> What, what you ask well, you batter's about? box is, is is unique this week. Um, I I made it about Tricky's favorite synthesizers for a particular sound or a particular concept. For example, uh, I asked him what his favorite synth under fifteen hundred dollars was. I asked him what his go-to synth, if he only had one synth to work with, was. I asked him ba 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 ba. Let's do it, Will. Okay, what's your go-to synth for bass sounds? Um, trilogy or SC1? Piano, acoustic piano. In the box or out? Either way, give it to me either way. Um, or give me both. I want to say Ivory and um, Kurzweil. Oh, wow. Outside of the box. Kurzweil has been a favorite for a long, long time. That 3000, is that the one you're using? Mm hmm. Golly, that, I remember that old Brian McKnight days. Acoustic guitar. Acoustic guitar? Um, or any guitar yeah, sound, yeah. you know, a guitar soundy sound. Well, acoustic guitar is my favorite like, uh, sound of guitar, and I always try to put acoustic in as many songs as I can, but I really like. Um, I don't know. I really like uh, doing solos, like the distorted old, like oh, yeah. Prince kind of sounds. You know, dialing up those old sounds. Cool, but for an acoustic, you probably just get, use a real acoustic. Then is what you're saying, yeah, right? Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. Oh, oh no, no, we don't do those. <laughs> wait, wait, you meant, wait. I'm sorry, I misheard the question. You meant do I use a fake acoustic? No, well, well, no. We don't do that. Well, that's what you were saying. I, I, I asked you what 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 synth sounded for an acoustic, and you and I thought you were saying. Oh, yeah. I don't do that. If it's supposed to, one. if it's supposed to be acoustic, then it's it's, it's got to be real. Acoustic. Yeah. On uh, my old day, uh, uh, old school. Of, speaking of old, uh, back in the day, uh, you were using a sound that's like like well, it wasn't like that, but. Oh, yeah. Jason does a better impression of that. On the dream stuff, on the Christina stuff, and 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 when I'd pull that sound up, uh, it was so perfect. It had energy. It had it filled that frequency spectrum that that a, a rock guitar fills, and you did it perfectly, and it, it made the song move. It, it became almost a rhythmic instrument. What was what, what was creating that sound on 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 Usher and um. um. Oh, that that particular sound that was from the Phantom, the X6. Um, I can't. I mean, it's a very common techno craft something. Yeah, that's just a great sound. I love that sound. I remember you. Mm -hmm. You used to always. I I I I thought I was killing the world, and you always used to. No, it's got to be brighter. It's got to be brighter. <laughs> Turn it up, Dave. Turn it up, Dave. Yeah, I mean, I I used to love that sound to get high end from it. You know, it wasn't. We use it a lot of different ways. Sometimes you couldn't hear it, you know. It probably seems like you mixed it a lot more than I actually heard it on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> well, I remember I was so excited on the Christina song. I had it just where I thought, man, he's going to love it. The first thing he came in, turn that damn buzz sound down. I was like, oh, <laughs> man, I can't win for losing. <laughs> He'd never tell Jason that. Uh, what, what, uh, what, what's your go-to for, like, just pads, you know? Basic pads. Um, pads. I'm I'm in Logic now. Uh, what is it? I like the pads in uh, one of the Native Instruments. It's I think it's like that. I I like that EX24. Oh, cool. There's some stuff I'm in that. Cool. I, know. Like I know what it is. Man. You can say anything to me. I don't know. Man, it's I know that's like. I mean, it's just some good basic stuff in there. I like. And and and. A classic road sound. What's your go-to synth for that? Um, 
I don't see a rose in here, Tricky. You ain't going to get away with that, so don't say a real one. Well, you know, I have them. But um, I like that EX88 in there. Okay. I, I use a lot of Logic stuff. What's your go-to synth when you just want to create quickly? You just, you just want to grab something, hook it up, and create. What's your go-to synth for that? Um, I'm sure you probably have more than the one. The MPC oh, 3000. Cool. Oh, cool. And um, what's your favorite synth for old school analog sounds? That little bad boy there? Um, yeah, the SE1 is one of my favorites. And then um, you said analog? Mm -hmm. Um I still like the Prophet and the OB8s a lot. Prophet 5? Yeah. When I'm back in Atlanta at my studio where I have like all my stuff, um, you know, we bring that stuff out because I got a whole thing of keyboards. You asked me, was I talking about analog? Whatever the other thing was, what was what's that one? What's that sense? What? Do you mean the digital? Yeah. Um, that's in Logic from um, Trilogy. Really? Yeah. But I, you know, one thing about me is like I have. I have different laptops from different eras because when they upgrade, they change sounds. So, Are you so, serious? I didn't know that. I mean, it's the same sound, but they perform differently sometimes. When they think they're making something better, they take away something that's good. So sometimes, wow. this is to all my like guys that like want to always have the new thing. Like, have multiple laptops too, so that you can keep certain eras because laptops can become vintage equipment too. Did you know that well? <laughs> they can now if you don't keep updating them to the new thing. Like you get the old stuff on there and you kind of get it like in a place where you love it and then then you make a whole new laptop that's made from a whole totally different space. For, for a guy starting out and he's got a little budget, say maybe he's got a $1,500 budget, what synthesizer would you, would you say, okay, if all you got is $1,500, grab this, what, what would that synthesizer be? I mean, if to be honest, I wouldn't tell them to get a synthesizer. I would tell them to get a laptop, because once you get a laptop, you can you have the ability to make records, you know, with native instruments, with native instruments and Pro Tools. And so, if you've got fifteen hundred dollars, I would say save up to um, buy something that you can just keep adding on to, which would be the laptop. Shout out real quick to uh, uh, Autumn. That's your that's your assistant, right, Autumn? Yeah. And to uh, Rachel, our girl, for for making all this happen, and uh, and Kook and Tech and yeah, we Andrew. got yeah we got a shout out to a lot of other people besides that because well give them, give them a shout out. Let me give a shout out to all the people that make me me, which goes from my man Coop, Dream, Esther Dean, Tech, Andrew Whooper, my longest engineer ever, Brian B. Love Thomas. B. Yeah, um, he, he was on the show, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All my assistants, Luis, Jason Sherwood, um, um, who are my other guys? There's so many people, so many different moving parts. Josh, recording amazing vocals for us and making sure that we have like amazing sounds with all of our artists. Um, and and then all my administrative team, my administrative team, Christy too, Judy, Judy Mark, Autumn. Craig, Aaron Pierce, oh, Mike Grieve, shouts out to my producers. No, uh, sounds. <laughs> sounds. All the people, Sean K, all the people that help us look great. So it's, it's so many. People, people are listening to that, and it might, it might blow past them, but music's a team sport, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. It, it really is. Absolutely. And um, can, can we look for, for any new Tricky and Dream stuff in the future? Absolutely. Yeah, me and Dream are cooking stuff right now. We got a lot of we have a lot of records that we went to um we went to New York and we wrote in uh for about I don't know, like a month straight. Just music that we never played for. Word on the street is is some of that stuff is the best stuff you've ever done. Yeah, we're starting to we're starting to like put it out like slowly, but you know, right now we'll we're at we're at a point where it's like 
he's doing certain projects that he wants to do and I'm doing certain projects that I want to do because I'm really focused on Red Zone Records and mm -hmm. film stuff and then we have the stuff that we do together in the middle and the stuff that we're doing together right now is just like crazy. Mm -hmm. All right, Trick, once again, I can't thank you enough for, I know you're busy and you're about to leave, and uh, the reason we're doing this at your studio is because you were kind enough to, to say, if you can come by, we'll squeeze it in before I have to leave, so I'm not sure where you're going, but be safe, my friend, love thank you, you, care thank about you. you, love you too, man. and uh, for you to take time to help, help me, it, it's a very special thing to me, so I'll give you a free mix. <laughs> and, and thanks again, man. All right. Thank you. All right, guys. I hope you learned something. I sure did, as always. I think, I think Herb, I think I'm learning more than any of the people watching this show. I mean, I, I, I played the JJP one like about 20 times. I did too, actually. I I'm did sitting too. in the studio trying all that. You know, Mike, all, all, the, all our guests, I've learned something from every single one. Yeah. And... Um, has it, has it affected your mixes in some ways? I, 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 I texted a couple of my friends that I feel like I've gotten about 5 to 10% better over the last three months just watching the show. Um, sometimes the information isn't there, one listen, one view. Uh, you can watch these things a thousand times, and Herb and I still lose the same amount of money, so we're not trying to get you to watch it for any particular <laughs> reason. It's just uh, what I'm telling you is even at my level, I have to watch some of these things to get that last little nugget of understanding, you know? Yeah, yeah. But speaking of that, I'm really proud. I talked with Mike Shipley. Uh, 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 I don't, uh, why are these people helping us out, Herb? It's like. Uh, it's Drew's good looks, I think. I think it is. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I can't thank all the previous guests enough. Uh, everybody's doing this out of the kindness of their heart. Uh, and you guys sure appreciate it. I, we love your comments. But Mike Shipley is another person that. I respect and admire a lot. Well, um, and, and also let's give a shout out to the audience. I think that good idea. now that people are calling us and wanting to come on the show, mm -hmm. it's because our audience is so enthusiastic, they're so mm -hmm. responsive, they're so passionate. So we really appreciate yeah. how much they. Yeah, we do. We do listen to you. We do try to, you know, uh, acknowledge your your suggestions for every aspect of the show. I really appreciate that. Uh, quick reminder about into the lair. Into the Lair is my favorite favorite segment on the show. Uh, it, it allows me to just be me, and um, I, I consider Into the Lair the the protein part of the meal. You know, mm -hmm. like uh, like I'm not taking away from any other any other thing, uh, but uh, I love Into the Lair. So we're 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 going to be back on track next week with those, and. Um, Thanks for uh, Vintage King. Alex is, uh, you know, always available to answer your questions. If you've got more questions, run to their website. Vintage King. <laughs> run to their website after the show. Um, and and just just a serious, uh, sincere thanks. We 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 we're doing this for you, and um, the feedback that we get from you helps sustain us when it's three four in the morning, and I'm getting those emails from Herb about. Uh, I screwed this, this up. I screwed that, that we up. This. We uh, <laughs> my, you know, being Latin, being Southern, my first inclination is, well, screw it. I just ain't gonna do this no more. And then I will read one of those emails, and it's just, just, just makes everything worthwhile. So thank you so well, much for being we, a part of this. We had an emergency. What? The um, our CJ in the chat room just got word that you have an inauthentic knockoff polo shirt, and we must change this right now. <laughs> it won't even come off, it's so fake. Oh, so we, we only do authentic oh, stuff on this show. Me, Dave. Yeah. Yeah. Let's get out of here. You sold it to me. Tell them goodbye. Let's go. Thanks, guys. Adios. Hey. See you later.